Hi guys, it's Will from Potato Strong. I'm pleased to welcome Bananiac to the channel here. We're going to have a chat about some plant-based topics, so welcome Tino. Hey Will, hey thanks for having me on man. Yeah, it's great to chat with you in, in person, you know, as opposed to just watching the videos. It's going to be cool. Definitely. Um, yeah, I just thought we'd go through some topics that are of interest to hopefully other people as well as ourselves. Um, one thing I was going to ask you just briefly was, how did you get into this lifestyle, and did you have weight issues or any other issues and, and that type of thing? Well, um, okay, so basically how I got into it is from the documentary Forks Over Knives. Like, that meant everything to me. That was, you know, the one of the biggest factors of me changing my diet is because of that film, Forks Over Knives, and it kind of went into the science and the reasons why people get sick from eating unhealthy foods such as animal products, you know, many of the processed foods out there, and how you can reverse it eating whole plant foods. So that was a big, big uh, motivator for me, as well as, you know, watching YouTube videos like Durian Rider Freely and other popular YouTube channels. So um, basically just seeking out education, reading books, things like that, just opening my mind, becoming aware of different solutions out there, you know, by eating a whole food plant-based diet that can solve so many factors such as, you know, uh, people's health, you know, the environment, people starving out in the world, not getting enough grains because they're being shipped out to the animals, and then, you know, the animals are getting slaughtered because of all this, so it was just a holistic lifestyle, and uh, I was hooked, but basically before, um, just to give you a bit of a background before I even switched my diet, I was in high school, and I remember eating one week every day at a burger joint called Five Guys. I would just eat there every day for a whole week, and I would eat a lot of junk food, lots of uh, meat, processed foods, not many whole foods, a few fruits here and there for, like, dessert or a snack, but it wasn't it wasn't as rich in whole foods as it is now. In terms of weight, I never really struggled <clears throat> in terms of having too much weight on. I did have excess weight. I was a bit more a, a buff guy back in high school, but I couldn't lift as much as the other guys. I sort of looked a little bit more buff, but I was still a little bit like jello-y, if you want to call it that. Like oh, I held a lot of water and a little excess fat, so it wasn't, um, it's not like now where I've lost most of that and I'm down to sort of that lean uh, muscle, but uh, just, yeah, um, this, at first, transitioning to vegan diet or a healthier diet was just to look better aesthetically, but once I realized the power of this diet and lifestyle, then I'd embraced it as a uh, as a holistic lifestyle approach. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. I, I um I was actually into the animal like welfare earlier when I was vegetarian, but so I avoided any meat, but I kinda thought, well cheese, you know, the cow's still alive, give it milk. I mean, wasn't really the truth, but but that's how I sort of justified it. And um but I was quite aware of the animal issues and um but still, it was pretty unhealthy, and uh, same thing for me, forks over knives, and uh, made a massive change. Like, it's, and the thing is, I've never been, I'm more of a scholastic person, like a read, book reading, learning person, in, you know, introverted, study, read books, play guitar, so never really athletic, um, never consider myself lean or anything like that, and uh, it's been... It's like a whole perception change of yourself. Like you, you just—it's actually weird because you think the animal stuff would be more, or environmental would be more powerful emotionally, and it is. But um, when I learned all the science, like you know, when you learn, when you dig into all the cholesterol, saturated fat, and everything, it becomes a really strong connection as well to health in your body, which I never had before. The other thing is people are hitting 40s, 50s. And you start to really notice the effects of the abuse of, it, of the food. And that's when the motivation can kick in for some people as well. Um, 
I was gonna. Did you want to ask anything? I I've got some stuff here, but. Um. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I actually have a question for you, because uh, you know you're in the YouTube community, and I'm sure you know that many people in the YouTube community are um. Are are leaning towards the raw aspect, and you're doing you know the opposite. You're you're a promoter of starch-based diet, like John McDougall, Dr. John McDougall. I want to ask you, um, do you do you see starch as a suboptimal food? Like, in a, to ask it in another sense, in another way, do you think that humans are designed to eat uh, starch as opposed to a fruitarian diet? Um, first of all, let me say like I I like fruit. Um, there's a it's complicated as far as why I did it and how I came to you know starch, um, and and a lot of it at a simple at one level. So I've got a lot of things floating around in my head to answer your question. But yeah, at, at one level you have a lot of young people who are doing raw or fruit type diets. And they haven't really developed a long history and behavioral patterns of eating cooked food. Um, I mean, they were a child and everything. It might be 20 years, but as an as you know, as an adult making decisions, um, a lot of people have grown up in a typical standard American diet. But for me, you know, I'm 45 now, and I I had a long history of cooked foods. You know, as as a main, like with meat and everything. Right. So, a lot of my preferences, I guess, would be from for a cooked sort of diet, just just as a bias or whatever you want to call it, as a preference. Um, and so, that's part of it, I think, when you when you really look at something and how does it resonate with you. Um, and like even when you're eating meat and you decide you're going to eat a plate of food without any meat. It's really strange, because what I started to do when I was vegetarian was put soy-based products, mm -hmm. like a chicken patty or a soy sausage or whatever, right? Because I needed that. So to go from that to I'm just gonna eat a bag of apples or something, you know, or it just seems yeah. so, it was just so remote from my personal experience. So that's that's definitely part of it. Um, one of the things I really liked about the starch solution was the history of starches. So there's the, uh, you know, the, it has a really important history, let's put it that way. Not, not so much, not just from health, but the ability to, to keep, to store rice and, and things like that, to transport it, to, to not be in a, necessarily in, around the equator, so you could be, you know, we humans could move away from the equator. Um, and so, but from what I read, a, a bunch of things show that we've adapted to cooked foods. And, it, you know, I've just been reading some books lately, and it's definitely hundreds of thousands of years that they see, you know, there's some differences in the exact amount, but uh, as far as use, the use of fire. And um, there's a lot of benefits when you cook food as well, like to expose nutrients and things like that. So I don't really think it's suboptimal. Like if you look at if you look at potatoes or or whatever, starches and vegetables, um, there's a lot of nutrients in there as well. You know, like if you compare oh, how much potassium is in a potato or whatever, you know what I mean. You can get at that level. Mm -hmm. But but I just look at generations of people, long living Asians and others that like the blue zones and stuff where they eat. A lot of them are like sweet potatoes, rice. Uh, corn and wheat and stuff like that. I think it has a really important history and it showed that, um, you know, there's a sort of a feeling that you should only eat something that would be naturally, you know, like a fruit would be, I'll pick it and eat it. There shouldn't be any, you shouldn't have to do anything. But we are human and we've advanced intellectually in our brains and, and I think that the cooking, like if you look at the stomach, and like I don't know all the science, but our stomachs are smaller, have shrunk compared to like gorillas and stuff like that because they eat a large volume of fruit. Starches are more calorie dense, so the volume of your food is less in your stomach, less time eating, 
there's amylase in the tongue for more, um, you know, for more starches in that and uh, in the genes as, as well. So I think that we've adapted to starches and um, there's also like all sorts of other practical benefits like financial access to fruit like for people that are in the northern or southern climates. Um, and so one of the things I don't really like is the implication that it's suboptimal, like you're saying. Yeah. And, and there's just long living populations. A lot, of, a lot of the athletes are doing marathons and stuff on cooked foods. What's your, um, what's your take? Yeah. So I, I started leaning towards the, the raw aspect when I first got into it because I was watching a lot of YouTube videos. That's what people were agreeing on and they would base their arguments on that. And it all makes sense. Um, I don't want to at this point in my life kind of like say this is the answer, like this is the way, you know, humans are designed to eat. I mean, I, you know, I, it makes sense that maybe we shouldn't eat, you know, fruit off the, off the vine or the tree and, but also at the same time, you know, starch makes a lot of sense because of our history and, you know, there must have been a reason why we went for starch uh, when we had fruit available or maybe, or maybe fruit wasn't available and starch, you know, played a big role in our survival of our species or something. Like, I respect both views so much, um, but as a future dietitian, you know, um, I just want something that's going to work for the population, something that's really easy, something that's really, you know, attractive, but also doesn't have negative effects. Because if you were to compare, say, potatoes to burgers, you know, they're both cooked foods, but, you know, which one is healthy, which one is unhealthy. So there's a big difference between, in, you know, the cooked food, because I feel like people are grouping all cooked food together, which, you know, it's like saying it's like grouping all raw food together, you know, some raw foods are toxic if you eat them. So uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying cooked food is suboptimal, but I think just from, you know, having a conversation and just talking about this stuff is just, it's, it's interesting to think about, but when it comes to giving advice to people and having them get on a sustainable diet for their health, you know, for our environment, that's, you know, I I think they said by 2050 we'll need a few more planets to just sustain, you know, the the food supply to to this to the, to our population. So I mean, we're facing some big issues. So all I want is just something that's sustainable, that's healthy for people, you know, that's um, cruelty free for the animals. Um, I think a starch based diet is awesome. So I have no problem with either views. Yeah. Um... Yeah. My goal is to unify the plant-based community. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I've been tempted to comment and do videos on certain topics, but um, it's kind of funny because when I got into this in December last year, there were more discussions within the plant-based community, more more arguments about raw cooked and different factions than actually going against like meat and dairy. Yeah. Um, all the, all the debates are within the plant-based community almost. And a lot of it's initiated by the raw people because they're saying that raw is better or it's or cooked mm -hmm. with poison. And I don't really want to demonize raw or, or anything or fruit. And what I did was, just to clarify, I the first day I went plant-based when I, um, after watching Forks Over Nines and Engine 2 Diets and all those ones, all the ones on Netflix, I tried to eat a bunch of grilled vegetables like uh, asparagus, zucchini, all that stuff, and I was starving. And um, my wife said, "Well, maybe you just need your stomach has to get adjusted to the food, and you know you're not used to the." And I just thought to myself, "I can't, I can't be hungry during the day. Like I just can't yeah. function." And I found Starch Solution, but so I stuck to that. I didn't really limit fruit in the sense that I counted how many fruits I had or anything like that, but once in a while I get bananas um, on sale, it's like uh, Baker's Bananas or whatever they call them, when they're, they're still perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. They're not even that ripe yet, but they got a few spots on them and, and nobody wants to buy them. If they're not you know, yellow or green, right. I'll make a smoothie, banana strawberry smoothie or ice cream, 
And what I do is I, I have it for breakfast, say, uh, I, like, so I, instead of my oatmeal, I'd have a smoothie or, you know, maybe banana ice cream or something. And I even emailed Dr. McDougall, and he said that was fine. It's not going to, you know, it's going to be fine. And yeah. so I could see myself, if I, I actually told the store the other day that if, if whenever they get bananas on sale to call me, I don't know if they will, but um, because they put them in a, a basket and I said, well, I'll take them all off your hands every time. Like I'll just buy them. And so they have my phone number so I could be eating potentially bananas like every, you know, as a, as a, um, as one of my meals. So, and then there's raw vegetables and, and uh, I, yeah, my, my really goal is to get people off the standard American diet, off the meat and dairy and into plant-based. So there's, yeah. there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, it's just that I don't want to feel like I'm doing something. Like one of the great things with Starch Solution, it talks about these warriors and, and even during riders talked about the, the uh, marathoners eating ugali, ugali and stuff like that. Yeah. So it gives you that confidence and that knowledge of history of how important the starches were and how useful they are. To, and there's really no documentation of like completely, as far as I know, fruit societies where, you yeah. know, where that's all they ate. So if we look just purely at the science and that, but I still think it's great. One of the things McDougall says is, you know, their fruit can be sweet and addictive, and you can sort of overconsume them, but and they're not really satiating. But when I did, you know, what I always find is there's the science, which is amazing, but also personal experience. So after like almost a year maybe of doing starch solution, I said, well, let me try a smoothie and see what happens. And there's people that say you shouldn't blend up things because you're supposed to chew them and all that. And I generally do that like for greens, leafy greens, but mm -hmm. but then there's like the guy who wrote, uh, what's that, Brandon Brazier? Um, oh, Thrive or? Thrive, yeah. yeah. He looks at it like energy. The more, the less energy the body has to, cons to, 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 do, to use to consume food. You know, so there's that way to look at it. Like if you if the blender acts as your teeth grinding everything, then you don't have to do that. Your body doesn't have to break it down. That's a totally different way of looking at um, consumption. But in yeah. general, I, I chew my food. But I mean, it's a banana. It's a, it's strawberries or whatever. I mean, it, we shouldn't get too critical. I don't think. Yeah. People eating bananas. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> blended. I mean. Um. But I'm I'm with you there. Like getting the getting the general direction right, as McDougal would say, just getting people on the plant-based program, getting them off standard American diet with lots of meat, you know, cheese and and animal foods and and processed foods. Just getting them on a plant-based diet. And if people want to explore and experiment between different kinds of plant-based diets, I say feel free to do it as long as it's working for you. Like go for it. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is. Just a quick thing is, I actually I, I did the starch, and of course I'm still eating some fruit and some raw foods like salads and stuff. Um, but I did my so you you know you've got the weight loss, 35 pounds that I dropped. I I went in, I did my blood tests. I got the cholesterol is incredible, 112 milligrams per deciliter. Nice. I just did my blood pressure recently. It's like below 100, like the systolic. I was getting down to 120, 115. Mm -hmm. I did it was like 98 over. 60 something and the pulse went down into the 50s usually um, without much activity and then all the other things related to in the blood work you know the, the B12 and the mm -hmm. various things so from a health perspective it looks fine nice if starches are suboptimal I'm not sure how it would sort of show itself um, yeah. but just based on all that I don't see I don't really see that um, but like I say I love fruit I'm with you. I like. I just want people to, to do this in whatever way. But one of the things that I like about the starch solution was it depends where you're coming from. Like the younger people seem to be okay with fruit, like going into it full time, mm -hmm. percent. But for people that are eating meat and potatoes and, and and with gravy and butter and all that stuff, if I say to them, "Hey, you can have mashed potatoes and gravy. Just tweak it." Yeah. You can have um, pasta. You can have pizza. You can have, uh, you know, shepherd's pie and all these things that our comfort foods and as far as getting people into this movement it's a great way to attract people um, to to this lifestyle because people think you know you're eating quinoa and kale or or just I don't know what they're thinking it's it's really 
like rabbit food or something. Um, one thing I liked about Engine 2, and they called it Plant Strong. Yeah. The show. That's why I called my, my site Potato Strong, because I thought potatoes you know, was better than saying plants. Just, But I wanted to show that it's not just skinny, sort of weak-looking people, you know, um, that there's so many misperceptions about about veganism and plant-based diets. Definitely, and it's eating about it's all about eating satiating foods like carbs, so like starch and and fruit as well. So um, that's that's another great issue is uh, you know people will go and do these high vegetable diets, which can't say it's not nutritious, but you got to get those carbs in. You know whether it's in the forms of starch like potatoes, rice, corn. Or fruit like bananas, mangoes, dates, figs. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like when I, I think I was talking about the smoothie when I, I blended probably, I don't know, the first time I did it was probably eight, eight or more bananas with some strawberries. Yeah. And I noticed that I was satiated for quite a few hours, like probably three, around three hours, something like that. And I didn't really feel like full. Like I didn't feel, I felt full, like satiated, but I didn't feel yeah. heavy. And yeah. so that's personal experience. Like when you do it, like you can say, "Oh, I, this is bad" or "That's bad," but when you actually mm -hmm. do it, so I was a starch kind of based person, but I, I still ate some fruit, and I decided I would try it, and I really liked it. And uh, so I, I would, I would find that would be. But when I'm telling people that are trying to go into, what I want, until I create my own, you know, potato strong diet or something like that. Um, I sort of would like people to stick to something because I find there's a lot of people into the diet mentality where they keep bouncing from one to the other. And so when I tell people about the starch solution, I try to make them do the, the actual starch solution. Mm -hmm. or, you know, but I have an idea. Like you could swap in a meal for a fruit, like a meal. It doesn't have to be in the morning. It could be at night or whatever. But yeah. But basically, because these are documented lifestyles, I. I I try to get people to stick to that, and that's what worked for me. And then when you get to a point where you're happy health-wise and, and leanness and all that, you could potentially start to make some changes. So mm -hmm. until I have a, a, you know, a, a documented approach, uh, I wouldn't really want people to vary. Uh, but they could experiment. That's yeah. the other thing I always tell people, is it working for you, is it not? Like if if you're finding problems, then you, you got to try to to make some adjustments. Um, Definitely. What was I going to ask you? Um, it was related to the... Uh, well, let me ask you something else. Um, what's your take on uh, calories? Like, or, or just before I get into that, Sure. Somebody emailed me recently, and they they said they were so confused by all the information. Like when they read about plant based, it says you know saturated fat and cholesterol is bad. But when they go on other sites, paleo, uh, and they hear that grain is bad and and too many carbs make you fat, the general population can be pretty confused. And you see the stuff on the news and everything like that. So what would you say somebody should do if they can't really figure out which which approach is correct or you know is the way to go? They're just there's too much yeah. information. That's a great question. Yeah, because there's so misconceptions out there. Like, and there's success stories on on both sides, really. Um, a good a good approach to that problem would be look at our number one killer. It's heart disease, right? If you look at heart disease, look at look at the solutions to heart disease. First, you have the conventional treatments. You have you know statins that lower cholesterol. You have heart procedures like opening people up for bypass. And if that sounds attractive to anyone, then fine. But then look at the diets. Look at the standard American diet. Is that really working out? I mean, not not so much. And then you look at the sort of natural diets, as I would call them. It would be more of like a paleo diet and a vegan diet. Compare the two. Which one would, you know, which one will cure heart disease? Well, the one full of cholesterol and saturated fat that 
we know causes heart disease. It's, it's been documented in so many studies. Or the one that's not full of any cholesterol and very little saturated fat. You know, that's, that's the diet that is curing our number one killer, heart disease. It's the whole food plant-based diet. And uh, if, if we can cure just our number one killer, imagine what else this diet can do. So I think I heard Dr. Gregor say that once, but that's, a, that's such a great approach is if we can cure our number one killer, I mean, we're set. Like we're saving so many lives, and usually other things are related to heart disease, such as stroke. Like that's another form of heart disease, except it's in the um, carotid arteries and then uh, diabetes and, and um, you know, uh, blood, blood sugar problems. So it's just, uh, yeah, I, I would say that. Uh, yeah, there's um, so many benefits to the plant-based diet. Yeah, for sure. Um, the, as far as like when people are confused about everything out there, um, what I did was I, I uh, try to look at the science, and that's, one helpful way is there's a guy, you know, Plant Positive has all those videos. Yeah. And it's not just another person like a blogger who's saying things, but you, he's referring, referencing a lot of studies. And, and then there's these meta studies, which are like studies of studies, like groups of, they look at 50 studies on saturated fat or something. So what I find really, because you read something, you think, yeah, that makes sense. And then like when you read Wheat Belly or something, and, oh, the weight grains changed and it's no longer, oh yeah, that's kind of, you know, you don't really know if it's true or what, what you need is yeah. critical discussions back and forth, critiques and critical debates, so yeah. when, when I see something in paleo, like somebody will have a short-term benefit with paleo weight loss and they might be, they might have some short-term gains, but, because some of these guys don't even think saturated fat and cholesterol is a problem, like they don't, they don't accept that, so then when you actually look at the study, that they might quote, and you don't maybe you don't you still don't know if it's true or not. But then you look at Pam Positor or somebody who can critique it, and look at the study and say, well, you know, um, this was wrong or they didn't do this right. And then you just you have to think for yourself. So I find that when I looked at the studies, like you know the recent study that came out that said butter, you know, you should eat butter. There was like 50. I made a study, and then somebody went in and you have to go to every single study and analyze it, and it's painful yeah. and kind of boring for the average person, but um, you just get to that point where your logic kind of kicks in. If you're just looking at health aspects, um, you know, that's, that's sort of what I look at, um, and then the person can try the diet. Like, if they try paleo, and a lot of people say, you know, they were constipated or had breath issues or you know, you can get your, your test, blood tested and all that and sort of, you know, see that because personal experience can, can be important. And a lot of times people really want to eat that stuff. So then when they look at the newspaper articles, they're going to sort of tend yeah. to believe the stuff that they're doing. So, you know, at, at one level I talk about the science and another level I say this worked for me. Right. This is the only thing that's ever gotten me to where I've been at right now. Right. Yeah. So, you mean you can just Yeah, I was gonna say you can just yeah, set the example like you you're saying, just show people that it's working for you. And real quick, a, a word about that cholesterol thing. Uh, a lot of paleo people will say, you know, look at me, I mean all the cholesterol I want and you know, my blood cholesterol is is in the normal range. Well, a lot of people will say that in the paleo community that dietary cholesterol is apparently not bad for you. But then again, most of them are calorie restricting, which is leading to weight loss, and weight loss causes blood cholesterol to drop. Right. So <laughs> you can either starve yourself to death on a paleo diet or eat you know, as much as you want on a whole food plant-based diet and kind of see the same effect in terms of cholesterol now kidney disease and all that stuff, that's going to be a bit of a variation, but... That's a good uh, point. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, the calorie restriction is usually, you know, and, and is where they're getting the benefits from. And there's so many nuances, like, there's a guy, Dave, uh, David Katz, the doctor, and he was sort of saying eggs are okay and everything. And he, 
he tested these people, and their cholesterol didn't really change very much, but their cholesterol was pretty high. It was like over 200. Mm-hmm. And, and then he added an egg or a couple of eggs or whatever it was, and the cholesterol didn't change. And somebody was saying it's like, uh, I think it was plant positive, but giving, uh, if you give an alcoholic an extra drink <laughs> every day and they don't really seem to get any drunk or, you know, it's like, I'm, and he's a guy who's generally on the plant-based side of things. But, you know, you just got to use your common sense a lot of times when you look at, like, when I think about common sense, like you just mentioned, There's a hole here, and there's two, two coming down like a car, you know, putting gas in your car or something. You're pouring stuff in here. Like, I don't know why people don't think it's going to get affect your body. Like, you pour thick, fat, greasy stuff, and they show tests where you can see it in the blood floating on top, you know. Yeah. And I don't understand when you eat cholesterol or fat or whatever how people think it just magically goes through you and doesn't get absorbed by your body like that's the thing I, I just can't at a basic level of just physical you know sludge going in and clogging up your I mean somebody I said some, somebody said something about somebody I don't do this I've never done it but somebody said you're not supposed to pour bacon grease or fat down your sink or something because it can clog the pipes I'm like well that's just like your your vessels and everything like I don't understand why people don't think there's a connection there but yeah. I've actually seen some some family members, like in-laws and that, with all sorts of issues. Diabetes. One just got diagnosed with diabetes, had kidney failure recently, and then they just had a stroke. And another guy had a heart attack, a friend, I guess, a neighbor of, a, of our in-law. And he said it was the stress from trying to apply for disability. So he had been trying to get disability insurance for his back problems. And they haven't been, they didn't want to give it to him, like permanent disability. And and then he had a heart attack. I mean the guy smokes and he's pretty overweight. And so I'm just amazed at the human's ability to not take responsibility or, or not connect their own act actions with the results. It's really, yeah. I've always sort of known I ate crap and that's why I had extra weight. Like I kind of acknowledged it, but there's a lot of people who think it's genetics or um, or, or uh, metabolism or something that's giving them the problems, not the, the food. Yeah, a lot of people will blame stress, but stress might sometimes be the trigger point, but not the cause. A lot of, a lot of people will blame stress. You know, I'm, I'm overstressed and, you know, this is happening because of this, but it's, it's the food. It's the food that people are putting down their mouth and in their bodies and we got we have to change that and i'm so thankful for all the education that's out there and all this free material like if people just youtube you know benefits of a plant based diet or something or look up john mcdougal or you know any of those speakers there's so much free information out there so i'm just yeah, was the internet yeah. i was up i was around before the internet and i know people that don't even have it now like in the country and stuff but it's um I just spent a lifetime learning and then I just, when I got into this area, I, one of the reasons why I and you and other people can help other people is we have this really strong desire to learn and to, uh, that's a big one. And I've done this before with other topics, but whenever I get interested in a topic, I just absorb everything. So I told people, like, like you said, the documentaries, Forks Over Knives, Engine 2 Diet, there was like uh, all sorts of ones, Vegucated. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, there's animal rights ones. Um, but then there's the books, like Start Solution, um, China Study. Um, I've read so many. And and then the internet, you know, with if you're careful, like in, in the YouTube, like Plant Positive, had so many. And so the information's there. And it's just a book. And so... One of my main goals with my approach is to provide sort of a, a moderate comfort food type approach that can get the people from the standard American diet and also dispel, just at the food level, the misconception about um, a bunch of things. The cost of the food, 
like where starches are pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of time, like I create mostly simple recipes, so they're easy to make and you can store stuff and take it to work and all that. And um, and the and the and the perception that it's not really tasty food or it's not filling or whatever. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the basic level. Um, I'm I'm really interested in, in all the other benefits, poverty, environmental issues, animals is a huge one. But I mostly talk about food as a gateway for people to come in. I've just sort of focused on that as far as what I talk about mostly. But, I mean, even the paleo stuff at 7 billion plus people, you can't have everybody eating grass-fed beef. I mean, they like to think that grass-fed would be healthy, which is arguable, mm -hmm. but it's just not sustainable. That's the whole point of the factory farming was to optimize and make it efficient to produce the food that, that, the, that people need, you know, which is really inefficient because you're taking the, the, the plant food and you're giving it to the animals and the water usage and the waste and all that is so inefficient that if you just fed the people the plant food directly, you know, you could feed way more people. So there's all sorts of other important issues that I don't talk a lot about on my channel, but are as important to me or not, if not more, than some of the stuff that I actually discuss. It's just a way of making it approachable to the average person. That's my main goal, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, if we can just if we can just pick one thing to change, whether it was food or, you know, to save the animals or to save the planet, I mean if we can just focus on food, all the other things would kind of domino, you know, kind of down the road later because you convince people that, you know, you're designed to eat a plant-based diet. You know, eating meat and dairy is not good for you. That that, sh that automatically shifts, you know, that conscious in their mind. Well, if I don't need to eat it, then I don't really need to support it or anything like that. And they sort of, you know, get into the vegan lifestyle of things and or just even reducing the amount of animal products that are used is going to benefit us so much. So, I, yeah, food is such a great way. You know, I talk about a lot of the health benefits of eating a plant-based diet, but just by even switching to a, you know, plant-based diet, you get all these effects that come down the road without even having to, you know, th even think about it. Um, it's already good for the planet and the animals. Yeah, I think that there's people that are interested in diet and lifestyle, and those are the ones that we generally focus on. Like when we talk about paleo or plant-based mm -hmm. in general, this is how I see it. It's people that are kind of interested in, in that. Like the paleo people are generally trying to be athletic, and some people are using it to lose weight. Um, but they're consciously thinking about their diet and, and that. And there's a disagreement on what is the best way to go, but I think the majority of people are on autopilot, like until they have a health problem or they gain weight or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're not actually making the conscious choice. Like you go to the grocery store and they grew up with their family eating chicken and beef or whatever, so they go to the store and they just buy the stuff. You know, it's just a pattern. And so yeah. what are the triggers that make people want to change? It's usually gaining weight or they get older and the health problems start to come. Mm -hmm. um, but because if you just on the, if you watch TV and everything, you're inundated with these ideas that you need calcium and you need protein with these animal products. But on the internet, you can actively go out and learn the truth about stuff. But it takes that initiative um, because even the newspapers and, are deceiving everybody, you know, with the, the old mentality because of the corporate sponsorship and and so, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to be an example. And then people that – I've got emails from people that start to hit 40s and 50s who start to have problems. Um, there's younger people and women and stuff who, you know, have weight issues. and It's all sorts of different reasons people can get exposed to it. But whatever way they come, we just try to help them. Right. Yeah, it's all you can do is just be an example and get the information out there to people. Yeah. Um, 
what's your take on calories as far as can you eat unlimited calories? Do you think people should count their calories? Um, is there any range or amount that you think people should eat? Um, that's a good question. There's a good debate in that, I suppose. Um, when I first got into this, Durian Ryder was a huge, huge influence on, on me changing my diet. And I love the guy. He's, he's a fantastic advocate of this lifestyle. Uh, he promotes eating an unlimited amount of calories, but what I what I think people take out of context is they don't take you know his lifestyle into consideration, so they try to replicate what he's doing. I think what he's doing for himself is obviously the the best for for Durian Ryder. He's he's eating as much as he cares for, and that's I I I do still say on my channel eat as much as you want, but don't try to replicate what someone else is doing exactly, you know, to the T because, you know, they're inspiring you. That's great that you're inspired to, to, to do what they're doing, but, you know, do what's best for yourself. Like, if you need to eat, I don't know, 2,500 calories, do it. If you need to eat 4,000 calories, do it, but don't, don't forcefully do it. Do it because you have to do it. Um, so there's not a real I, – I used to advocate or – around 3,000 calories minimum as like a sort of a template for people to do and, and see if it works out and for me it worked out great. Um, that 3,000 calories average from day to day works really well and it was a good mindset because when you transition to this diet, you know, when you're eating lots of oil and, and, and meat and stuff, that's all, that's a lot of calories per volume. So when you fill your stomach up completely of full of meat, it's going to be a lot more calories, say, than potatoes or something. So it was good to be conscious of how much I was eating and I was making sure I was getting enough just so I can have enough energy to go out for a bike ride or, you know, to stay aware in class and things like that. So just eat as much as you care for. I mean, it's, it's you know, don't force it down, but don't don't feel hungry. Don't lay in bed, you know, thinking about food and you can't go to sleep. Eat as much as you care for, and uh, that's uh, yeah, that's my best advice for that. Yeah, I think that um, people need to think about you know where they're coming from. Like when you're saying people are eating meat and dairy and all that, and then you don't want them you want them to eat enough food because they're used to eating filling fatty foods. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is if they were eating a standard American diet and they're probably eating thousands of calories because of the fat and the oil and all that, and then they go to plant-based and even if they ate 3,000 calories, it's probably a, a reduction in calories and so they're going to lose weight. But if somebody was an anorexic and they were eating 1,000 calories or less, and all of a sudden they start eating 3,000 calories, they're going to they're gonna gain weight. And they yeah. might want to gain weight. Like I, it, it sort of depends on what the goal is. Like when somebody says, well, you were calorie restricting, well, does that mean they're underweight right now and they want to put on some weight? Or it means they did calorie restrict and, they, and then they gained the weight again. So to me it's kind of like, were you eating, like when I lost 35 pounds, it's like I was eating way more calories with a vegetarian diet and to a plant-based diet because of the calorie density. Yeah. And... Um, so if somebody was calorie restricting and they were eating a lot, like a, a, a very few number of calories, I was thinking they could ramp up the calories. Mm -hmm. Like if you came off a big fast or something, you probably don't want to go crazy. But yeah, like at the end of the day, the problem, I think some people were actually force feeding like beyond, like I don't understand that, but they were eating more than they wanted to, which doesn't make sense. Like, you know, they should just eat till they're full, right? Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a, a common sense approach, like don't try to reach a certain calories that force yourself. Dorian Ryder was saying to me one time that because he bike rides and runs and all that, he, he has to eat that, like he, yeah. he drives the, it drives the hunger. But on a, at the same token, in certain scenarios you could overconsume even if you don't really have the desire, like if you were to blend a ton of things together and, and, and stuff that you couldn't normally eat in a whole form. You, you know, it's not easy to really overconsume. Yeah. Calories, but there are people that are emailing me 
usually they're older, or not older, but middle-aged, and they might be either plateauing, stuck, or gaining weight. And um, I think that, you know, like we said before, if it's not working for you, you should try to make some adjustments. So do you think somebody should wait a year or two if they were gaining weight? Do you think they should keep going through that weight gain phase for a year or two, understanding that it's eventually going to settle, or do you think there's another way to do it? You mean like um, if they should be eating the same amount of calories if they're gaining weight? Is that what you're asking? If they keep gaining weight to just be patient and wait oh, until okay. that stuff heals itself, or do you think they should sort of ramp up calories or do it in a different way? Gotcha. Um, well, before I would give an answer, I would just make sure I would ask them, uh, you know, to make sure that they're eating lots of whole plant foods, they're keeping their fat intake low, so no oils, um, no processed foods, just to, just to be on the safe side, um, and very little salt, because salt has been shown to, to cause a bit water retention, but if it's in a, you know, if it's in a moderate level, that's, that's okay. Um, I, I still wouldn't want them to feel hungry, though. I would say eat as much as you want. I would set the rules. I would say you're allowed to eat whole vegetables. You're allowed to eat whole fruits. You're allowed to eat potatoes, um, you know, whole grains, beans, and those are the rules. And once I've established that, I would say eat those in whole form and, and eat as much as you want because the dangers with saying, um, you know, calorie restrict, then – that's that's gonna set some bad habits. That's gonna get them maybe sneaking a, f a few nuts or you know using some oils or eating processed foods. So I would just say focus on whole plant-based foods because, like you said before, the calorie density in those foods are already so low. Um, so it's going to be a calorie deficit from their old diet anyway, if you want to think of it like that. So they're gonna be eating less calories than they were from before. Um, so I would just say focus on whole plant foods. Those are the right foods as are healthy foods. Um, once you set the record straight, then you know, eat as much as you want until you're satisfied and give it some time, of course. You know, it's, it, it will take some time to, to get the weight off, but you'll get there. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, you have a lot better experience talking about that. I mean, you, you've lost so much weight doing it. So uh, what, would, what would you have to say about that? Would you let, I let just, them? Yeah. I don't have a number at all. I just say eat until satiated. Yeah. Um, cool. McDougall talks about if you're stuck. Like what I was talking about, the reason I asked the question was sort of solving problems from emails that I get about, you know, um, it's more specific to people that might have a problem if, they, if they're stuck. Or, and um, McDougall talks about changing the starches down to like a half or a third of the or, or about yeah. a half plate. And yeah. A few times I've cut back on the starch and I found that I, I got hungry like, yeah. a lot sooner. So it's not really worth it because, say for example, if you're eating a plate of starch, like baked fries or something, and you cut that down a bit, and let's say in two hours you get hungry, like before bed, say at 7 or 8 o'clock at night you get hungry again, you're going to go snack on something. That could be potentially hundreds of calories. And so if you would have just eaten a bit more, at dinner, you may not have wanted to eat anything else in the evening. So, you know, you have to look at the overall day-to-day -day, uh, intake. But, but, yeah, I don't really think about calories. I tell people to eat until they're satiated. Right. Um, for me, I need starches. Like, even rice doesn't work that great. I need beans or, like, potatoes are the best. Beans, mm -hmm. when I have these rice and beans with salsa and corn tortillas, like, probably the corn helps as well. Yeah. It's quite filling. Um, even bread, which, you know, sometimes people limit because it's a little higher density, but when I make pizza or have bread with soup or something, it definitely helps. Um, so for me, hunger is a really big driver for my, my diet. I, I can't be hungry. I just hate that feeling. And so I have to eat three meals mainly. I, I tell people three main meals that are pretty filling um, for probably three hours or so, if if not more, and if you if you don't get to that point, make a note of it and adjust the next time. So make sure you eat more, uh, more food. Um, so 
Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Like not to be, not to be hungry and not to be restricting yourself. Um, Jeff Novick has a thing about fine tuning. If you find that you're stuck, and that is to modify the calorie density. So, like you said, oils and nuts and all that. But if you want to go further, yeah, some of the flours and the breads. Oh, that's true. And he also mentioned that raw is usually not as calorie dense because it's not as absorbed. That's the other thing when people in some of the raw movements are talking about 3,000, like a lot of times that's not really the calorie. I think they're overestimating. I think a lot of that stuff doesn't really get absorbed fully. Right. That they're, um, and so that's a good thing in the sense that yeah. you eat a lot of raw foods and you're not really, not only is it low calorie, but a lot of that stuff is not really absorbed as much as uh, some of the others cooked stuff. Um, so, yeah, so when, when I talk to people, in, like I mentioned calories, or when they ask me, I always say focus on what you eat, not how much. Yes. Yeah. You the problem I feel. And the thing is, we don't know everything that people are eating when they ask us a question, but I talk about, well, did you ever go to a restaurant? Because, I mean, you can't trust them 100% most of the time. They're going to put oil and stuff in there, but you might find a restaurant that you can trust and that doesn't do that, but a lot of times there's problems. And then people go to social gatherings where there's stuff, there's fast food, junk food, so, and then in a lot of the processed foods, cans, food, like sauces, there's sugars and, and oil in like tomato, like spaghetti sauce. And um, so trusting that all that stuff is, is not there, and they're really eating whole foods, which is probably a pretty rare situation. At that point, Jeff Noah does have some things about eating lower calorie density food where you reduce a bit of the starches and eat more vegetables and maybe a bit more raw type foods. That's so I don't really think about calories in that, but just kind of what what the makeup of the diet would be. Right. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Because it's such a natural signal, hunger that is. It's such a natural signal to listen to. Um, and I feel like a lot of people are kind of ignoring it to to get quick quick uh, weight loss. Yeah. Yeah. Result. yeah. Do you have any um, anything? Any other questions? Um, not not that I can think of. Uh, let's see. What about the salt, sodium? Oh yeah, salt's a good one. What's your take on that? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, right off the bat, I I do eat a little bit of salt, um, usually in the form of like ketchup or salsa or something like that. With it's always with my starch, um, and I I don't really add like the salt shaker. That's just my personal preference. Um, in terms of uh, health, I guess, it's, just, it's been a controversial topic from what I've seen. Um, a little bit of salt, say like, I don't know, around 1,000 milligrams per day or something like that, or even up to 2,000 milligrams per day, uh, that's okay. Um, I think a lot of people have agreed that that's, that's a healthy limit. Whether you should eat any salt or none at all, that's another debate. Um, Dr. Goldhammer, uh, True North Health, he, when he has his patients, he does a lot of fasting stuff and then tries to, you know, uh, he does SOS-free diets, which is no sugar, salt, or uh, oils. He gets pretty good results too, but then you look at someone like McDougal, whose program is so easy to follow, you know, he adds a little bit of salt in the, the forms of sauces or, or just a little bit on, on the surface of the food. He gets great results with his patients as well. So I don't think salt is such a big of a problem as some people are making it to be. Like in my nutrition classes, they emphasize it so much. I think salt is more of like a, a scapegoat or something that people sort of blame as to, you know, why they gain weight or gaining a lot of weight, like we're talking, you know, obesity and, and why they're having high blood pressure issues. Um, some people can benefit from a no-salt diet, but I think the general population, if they were to go on a plant-based diet with a little bit of salt added, I think they would be fine as long as they can keep it to a moderate level. But what do you think, uh, Will, about salt? Yeah, I'm pretty much exactly like you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't really add it. 
like in a salt shaker as well, but it is in yeah. some stuff, like you said, ketchups and all that. Yeah. And then I've got this um, veggie stock powder. Right. And here's the thing. Yeah, it's partly, like I said earlier, with the skepticism about the studies, but as far as I know, whenever they look at these studies, it's in a... First of all, a lot of studies, as you know, are like surveys of, or like, what do people eat? Okay, you know, they ask them what they ate, and then they look at the health. And so salt comes with all the animal products. Mm -hmm. pretty much. That's a great point. Right? Like, I, I always say, is there any plant-based studies where you have a low-fat McDougal vegan, and you have people on different levels of sodium, and for like 40 years on the edge, you know, or whatever. Um, but... So I'm highly skeptical when I look at a lot of that stuff because I know that, um, you know, there's the animal products are in salt is, is with this typical diets. But the, the most hardcore person that I know of is Jeff Novick, who uh, generally tries to limit it, like you say, to 1,000 or 1,500, I think it is. Um, but, and, and there's a lot of times salt is related to blood pressure. And my blood pressure... When I used to go to the um, doctor or into the pharmacy, it was 145. Like, I always remember the systolic, and the, and the diastolic was usually 90 or 85, something like that. But the systolic was always 145. And I bought a, um, a home, a Panasonic home blood pressure monitor when I started this. And it started to drop pretty quickly in the 120s and then 115s. And I didn't measure because I was got down to 115. I just stopped taking my blood pressure. And then a couple of days ago, I took it, and it was 98. And, um, you know, we do – our blood needs we, – we do need sodium. But, you know, there's a balance in the blood. There's a, definitely a need for it. And um, that can – now, people always say blood salt increases your blood pressure and all this kind of stuff, but it's, like you said, it's a scapegoat. I think it's more of the fat and the diet. But but I buy low sodium. Like you can make things like if you want to make your own ketchup, make your own salsa. You can buy like I buy crushed tomatoes and diced tomatoes and stuff like that in a can that are no sodium added. Not all the time. It depends on if I can get the. There's a blue menu uh, company. So I definitely look for no sodium added. The thing is, I I want food. When I buy stuff, I don't want sodium or sugar added to it. Yeah, I agree. Or oil. Like if you buy spaghetti sauce, let's say, I can't really buy spaghetti sauce where I live because it's got oil or it's got sugar and salt in it. And it's not that I really want it in there in general. So. Mm -hmm. I, in an ideal world, if I bought all the sauces and stuff, the salsas and the vegetable broth, all mm -hmm. that stuff, there'd be no sodium. And then yeah. I could either add it or I would get used to not having it. That would be like my ideal scenario. So, But it is in the things that I'm purchasing, and I'm really not worried about it. And it's not. I, I read somewhere that it's not just about blood pressure, but it can affect the arteries, harden them or something. Like just on its own, you know. That there's, yeah. Even if you don't have high blood pressure problems, but there's a doctor, Pam Popper. You know, she's a plant-based doctor, and she's had three videos now where she's talked about sodium, and she's she's for it. She's she yeah she's not against it. And I said to Jeff Novick, well, what do you think about this? And he goes, well, obviously we disagree. And I really like Jeff Novick as a registered dietitian in general, but um, I I've not been able to get a really good definitive. Answer and the other thing is that sodium or salt can really make it easier. Like this diet is fairly restrictive in a sense that there's low fat, no oil, and all these things that people are used to having. And um, like I'm like you, I don't really add salt to my to my food, but it's in some of the the sauces. And if it makes people eat this way, it's the least of the worries as far as you know, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, if we can make the food sort of more appealing to the people transitioning as well, because you said it, some people may think it's so restricting, but, you know, you make some, say, low-fat vegan tacos with some good salsa in there that has a little bit of salt, people are going to want to eat it, and, you know, 
the more you stay on this diet too, I feel like your taste buds change so quickly that you automatically want to go towards like a lower sodium end. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I see. I'm I'm okay with salt. Um, if people want to re- refine their diet more and more pure, and you know, in in a sense, that's that's fine. Um, I'm okay with having that little bit of convenience, you know, opening up, you know, a, a salsa and and putting it a little bit on there. And I feel like it's a good way to get in excess calories because I know we were talking about calories before. But if I need something, you know, to to really just sort of get more food down in me and and make it a bit more uh, stimulating. I'm I'm okay with that, you know, because sometimes those long bike rides can be a little bit, <laughs> a little bit draining. But um, yeah, salt is is not as big of a problem as as the other stuff which we've talked about, you know, meat, dairy, and and uh, processed foods. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, yeah. just if it helps people eat that stuff and you know eat a bit more healthy, it's and like I said, I haven't really seen a definitive study that. Yeah. Really make me like I'm not trying to pile on tons and have. Uh, mm-hmm. I, could, I could probably get more than a thousand or two thousand. Yeah. Because if you use the veggie, um, I use veggie stock powder, like a bouillon, and mm-hmm. what is it? Ketchup and sometimes some of the sauces. Like I have tomato paste in that. I can't get where I live. I can't get paste without some sodium. Like I, I would if I could. Yeah. But um, but you know there's so many other things. You add up the totality, like in the morning when I have oatmeal and, and fruit, there's no salt in that at all. Yeah. And a lot of things that I eat don't necessarily have sodium. So when you add it up, I'm not even sure how much it would be. But yeah, it's just not. Um, I'm not going to be completely restricted. But as like if I can get the no sodium added uh, versions, I'll definitely look for that. Right. And, I don't yeah. know what we do if my blood pressure got too low. Like, yeah, you know, it's getting down there pretty good. Um, but uh, you know, you don't. Some people, I don't know if salt's the answer to that. If you get too low, but yeah, I think I always think of my my arteries that are cleaning themselves out, and uh, they don't have to, the heart doesn't have to work as hard. It's just uh, a good sign overall. Yeah, and like you said. Um, you know, we eat plenty of meals that don't even have any salt in it. So I think, you know, a meal or two here and there um, throughout the day is, is okay um, to have salt too, you know. I mean, most of these Americans, they're adding salt to the food that already has salt before they even buy it, and then they're eating animal products with it, and, you know, it's just a whole mess. I think having a few meals with a little bit of salt is not going to be an issue. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, um, so you're doing a, you're studying nutrition. How how much more uh, do you have to go to finish the degree? I have one more year, and then, um, well, actually, it's just this year. So it's uh, this semester, and then spring semester, and then I'm I'm done. Um, and then once I'm done, then I have to do three internships, which is uh, con- it consists of uh, clinical, so in a hospital setting, food service. Um, so I think that could still be in a hospital setting as well, uh, you know, a cafeteria or something like that. And then uh, community work, which would be, if you want to think of PCRM as a community mm-hmm. nutrition organization, just getting uh, education out there to the public and, and things like that. So I have to do those three uh, internships. Once I do that, then I take the national exam to become a registered dietitian and that's pretty much it. So it's been quite a journey, but you know, can't wait to be done. <laughs> and uh, where do you think you might work? What uh, location? Um, PCRM would be great. Uh, I mean, I I love the work that they do, and because they're they're not just I, I love their their health advice. It's it's fantastic, but they're also doing great work for environmental um, advocacy and advocacy for better ethical treatment of animals. So uh, it's just such a great organization holistically and the fact that they live you know so close to me they're in uh, Washington DC so it's you know right down the street and it's it's mm-hmm. so close so be fantastic to, to work for them um, or you know a, a private setting sort of thing having clients online would would be great as well but just kinda keeping doors open right now and seeing where I can go with it yeah I think it's it's an amazingly 
you know, I think it's growing a lot right now. And so it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, I've sort of thought about it myself. I've done a lot of education in the past, and, and it's it's sort of painful to think about to go through it again. Like I have a, a, a degree in master's as well, but not to get nutrition, I'd have to do a, a fair amount of the basic degree first. I guess because I have a Bachelor of Science, but it's not really in that area. So, but I thought about it just to have the um, credentials. But I live in um, New Brunswick, Canada, on the East Coast, and the, the people here are incredibly unhealthy, overweight, smoking, a lot of seafood, like deep fried clams and all that stuff. And um, there's not also not a lot of money. Like it's it's fairly poor area, uh, province, and. Um, Right now, I don't know, I think about helping all the people on YouTube and on the internet. I mean, I'm not a, an expert with all the knowledge, but um, it's, it's enjoyable at this level. I, I just haven't quite figured out if I want to take it, formalize it, especially going through like when you know the knowledge, like you said before, like where the, the information is still the standard American diet. It's not... Um, it's not as plant-based as you like it. I went back when I was 36, I took jazz guitar, and there was a lot of courses that I questioned. Like, I was 36 at the time, and everyone else was 18 years old. And I was questioning, like, why are we learning this, and why are we doing this? Like, you know, and um, I think it would be pretty frustrating <laughs> for me to... Uh, how do you find, like, when you get exposed, you have to just kind of go through the motions, right, to get to do what they ask you to do to get the, the course... Um, yeah, it is a little bit frustrating, you know, being taught that stuff, but from what I'm finding, it's not so much, um, <clears throat> the academy or the science per se that's wrong, it's more so of the bias of professors and, 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 uh, sort of the education system, because if you look at the academy of nutrition and dietetics, you know, you go on their website, you look at the information about vegan diets, they're for it, you know, and, and they have the science to back that up. But what happens is, unfortunately, you know, you have industry that's, you know, funding them and, uh, you know, plays such a huge role in our food system and, and politics, if you want to think of it that way, that, you know, it, it sort of influences this sort of education on, you know, the benefits of a meat-based diet and, yeah. and, eat, and drinking dairy and all this stuff, so... Um, yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah. Andy Bilotti talks about that, I think. Okay. Andy Bilotti, that RD. No. He's a, he talks a lot about the corporate influence, like when he goes to these conferences and it's all sponsored by McDonald's or Pepsi or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, like, I have a passion for this area now to help people, but I don't know if I'll take it further. And I'm, I'm a bit older, like, I'm 45, so I don't, I don't have to do a new career per se, um, but so yeah, I'm struggling right now. But I, it's great that you're that you're going to be an influence on you know the future generations and and the, because I think we need a lot more plant-based registered dietitians. Like I called the my where I live is a province. Like you guys have states. I called the um, the association up here, the dietetics for New Brunswick, and they said that they would recommend, like they have to recommend cheese and all that. So um, there's, like if you're going to work in a hospital setting and follow their sort of guidelines, you know, it could be rough. But yeah, I'd be more, definitely more in a private, like taking that knowledge and coaching and sort of doing it more entrepreneurial. Yeah. But maybe at the beginning getting into like PCRM or whatever. Mm -hmm would be great for uh, exposure, I think, for sure. And they're a great organization. It's good that they that they live they're in the same location as you. Yeah. Um, all right. <clears throat> That's a pretty good show. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It'll keep people busy. Um, I'm just going to stop this the video. and uh, So hopefully everybody enjoyed that chat, and uh, we'll talk to you in the next video. See you guys. See ya.